Thank you very much. I am very happy to be with you this afternoon and to present uh, what is the present stage of heat uh, diagnosis. So I will speak about uh, the situation in 2008 of uh, diagnosis, laboratory uh, diagnosis of heat. Uh, so uh, from uh, the presentation of Dr. Johnson, you learn that how important it is to make an accurate diagnosis of heat. Uh, and the understanding of heat mechanism and the role of PFOR-dependent antibodies or more generally heparin-dependent antibodies is very important for helping us to develop new assays and to adjust the assays to the, their clinical predictivity. It is also very important to confirm an immune-mediate heat when it is suspect from clinical conditions because the clinical context where heat occurs is frequently difficult to manage. Alternative, alternative therapies are not always safe and easy to manage. And the patient can need again heparin because it remains the most efficient anticoagulant in many conditions. And in this case, if you can exclude heat, then the patient may benefit again from heparin. This slide, uh, a complex slide, summarizes uh, how we understand now the mechanism of heat, which are induced by the heparin-dependent antibodies, mainly targeted to heparin PF4 complexes that uh, you can see in purple. And these antibodies bind to platelet and cellular cells or other bl blood cells. Thank you very much or other blood cells uh, which can expose heparin PF4 complexes and then PF4 uh, trigger many uh, mechanisms which can lead to platelet activation and destruction, thrombocytopenia and sometimes thrombosis. But you can see that it can be a very multifactorial and complex mechanism invol involving platelets, their interaction with endothelial cells and other blood cells, and then uh, finally uh, platelet leukocyte aggregates and uh, thrombosis. And what can also favor occurrence of uh, heat is uh, the clinical context and disease used to develop at pathological sites. And patients who develop heat used to develop heat always at the same uh, clinical sites. So uh, what is also very important to remember is that for forming the target antigen for binding heparin-dependent antibodies, we need to have a very well uh, uh, defined ratio between PF4, you can see the tetramer here, and heparin. And when you reach the stoichiometric PF4 heparin concentration, then these multimolecular, high molecular weight complexes are formed and they expose cryptic epitopes able to bind uh, heparin dependent antibodies, mainly uh, those targeted to PF4. If PF4 is in excess or heparin is in excess, then no complex is formed and antibodies are not. Uh, um, are not bound. And we use this uh, I would like to come back uh, to go back. Okay. Previous. Okay. And we use uh, this uh, finding for developing immune assays target to heparin and PF4. The major issues which uh, we are facing today for the diagnosis of heat are summarized on this slide and they are observed frequently in clinical context because they can mask or mimic heat and we have pseudo heat or a heat which is not yet immediately diagnosed with the clinical survey. And we can observe this in infections, inflammation, some surgeries during antibiotic therapy, which can induce also thrombocytopenia. And heat can occur in rare cases in the absence of thrombocytopenia, or it can be masked by a high uh, platelet uh, count. Sometimes platelet kinetics are atypical, and false platelet activity assays can be observed. 
Coming back to the laboratory testing, so we can discuss what is now the usefulness of laboratory assays, uh, how we can control the variability of platelet donors used for activation assays, and you know that you have to select the good platelet donors to have an efficient platelet activation assays, and what is the significance of asymptomatic antibodies? As you saw from the iceberg model, only few of these antibodies are really uh, pathogenic. What is the significance of these heparin-dependent antibodies? We know that they are mainly targeted to heparin and platelet factor IV complexes, and they are associated, probably they directly trigger the mechanism which induce heat. Many of them are asymptomatic, including IgG isotypes. IgM and IgA are almost always asymptomatic, but in some cases they can be pathogenic. IgG are more frequently pathogenic, but in some cases they remain asymptomatic. What is also the significance of the high IgM and IgA prevalence in some clinical context, mainly IgA, and now there is an increasing suspicion on some pathogeny pathogenicity linked with IgA isotypes. And the major question which remains open is how can we identify those antibodies which are truly pathogenic? Uh, can be relied on isotypes, on antibody affinity and ability, or on epitope specificity. <laughs>